new technological thriller that is actually available today, which you can buy and rent on Google Play, Amazon Video, and iTunes, and select theaters, right? And yes, and a lot of other places as well. It's on uh, uh, lots of other places. I don't have the list in front of me, um, <laughs> and uh, go, but yeah, I think you can find in many places. Well, for, first of all, let me go ahead and introduce uh, some of the people who are actually here. Um, once I call out your name, you could just wave or whatever you want to do. So first of all, we have a uh, director, Michelle Danner. Hello. Hi. There you go. We have Jason Chase Tyrell, the writer. Hi, everybody. We have Holly Amber Church, the composer. Hello. We have Tafari Dejan, the editor. Hello. Thank you. Brian Drillinger, the producer. Hello. Valerie Debler, the producer. Hello, everyone. Then we have some of our cast here. Grant Bowler, who plays Henry Sharp. Then we have Nicholas Danner, who plays Mike Sharp. Hi there. <laughs> and we have Oscar Debler, who plays Sam Sharp. Hi. And not, not to forget, we have Darren Weiss playing Lyle, and I believe he lost his mustache. <laughs> <laughs> I did. <laughs> so, Let's ask a nice general question. How gratifying is this that this film is finally released, especially during times like this? Anyone? <laughs> yeah, it feels great. We're very excited for the release. And uh, you know, I got a little delayed because of uh, you know the pandemic. But uh, it's finally seeing the light of day in many different platforms. Gravitas is distributing, and uh, we had our wonderful publicists, Emily Wei uh, from PMK, uh, another Emily and Sarah, and they've done, they did a great job, and uh, hopefully lots of people will want to see it, and it'll find its audience. Jason wrote a great script that I fell in love with, so I'm glad I got to direct it. Excellent. And I also want to remind uh, Facebook and Instagram audiences that you can actually start asking your questions in, in the chat. And then we will, we will direct questions to anybody here on, on this panel. So, Jason, simple question. Where did the original idea came from? Because this is kind of out of left field for some of us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess it is, you know, so I grew up uh, watching and reading a lot of stuff sort of at the intersection of horror and science fiction. I think back to my childhood, uh, stuff like the Twilight Zone and amazing stories. And, I, you know, I love um, anything that takes um, normal people, real people and puts them in extraordinary and sometimes terrifying situations. I've always been kind of drawn to telling those kinds of stories. Um, and I think, you know, as I got older and, and you know, I'm probably a Gen X, maybe one of the last um, generations that remembers, you know, pre-digital times, right? And sort of seeing as um, smartphones took over and now we have smart devices, right? And our homes are sort of being um, monitored for us. You know, I always wondered kind of how these were changing us, how devices were sort of impacting our lives and, you know, the things that we sort of now... Um, take as normal that could be looked at, you know, if you go back 10 years, 15 years as um, shocking, and now we just sort of accept them. And actually, when I was first pitching this story around, um, initially, people were like, gosh, you know, that's impossible. Like, no one would ever wear, you know, uh, an anklet. No one would ever go for this. Like, that's just crazy. And then, you know, a year later, a couple years later, you're reading stories about you know, parents microchipping their children so that they can keep an eye on them. And, and it, it's now like commonplace, this stuff, and not quite that fantastical. Um, so I, I love the intersection of sort of technology and how it impacts us. Um, and then the other side of it, I'd say, is um, really looking at these, you know, these strange impulses that we get, right? The things we don't talk about, things we don't say out loud to people. Um, anyone that's ever been in a bad relationship, right? Anyone that's ever had a, just a strange moment with themselves and 
thought something and then went, where did that come from? Is that me? You know, like, is, is that, who's thinking that? Who's, whose impulse is that? I loved the idea of, you know, looking at those sort of impulses that we get and then dismiss and thinking about what might happen in this situation if we stop dismissing them and just gave into those impulses. Um, so that's really sort of how it all came together for me. Excellent. We already have a first question from Instagram. What was your favorite part of working in this movie? Anyone could answer this question. My favorite part was working with a wonderful cast that ended up saying yes. It's always thrilling when an actor says yes to a part. And starting with Grant, because he was actually the first actor that said yes. Um, and uh, I was, you know, honored that he had that kind of trust in me. And I know that he loved the script. And, um, you know, that was, uh, that was the beginning. I think, yeah, you don't know this, Grant, but I think that you may be the reason why this movie got made. Because you were, I don't think you know that you were the first one that said yes. <laughs> No, I didn't know if that could be. Discussed. Yeah, and you were my first choice. Like, I didn't go to oh, somebody. Oh, thank you. Right. Yeah, so you were like, you you know, you kind of, and then I called you, and I couldn't get through to you, and all of a sudden, you called me back on my landline a few minutes later. I thought it was such a surprise, because nobody It was all my people, wasn't it? It was the wall of people that you couldn't get. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, but that's what it was for me. I think for me, it was um, getting with the crew and like talking and having a nice conversation and everyone being kind of a family, uh, creating that really nice and comforting aspect. Um, and so, yeah, that, that was for, for me. I mean, yeah, for me, um, you know, we shot this back in 2017. This was the first uh, feature that I got cast in and I worked with Michelle um, private coaching for a while and she liked how I progressed and she's like uh, hey I want you to come read for this role and it was interesting because it's not usually uh, the role that I played sort of this nerdy um, best friend video game player it's not the sort of roles I go out for and I've been cast in probably four or five features since and it's usually like boy next door or like the athlete or something like that so it was really cool to actually do something that I've never done before and um, have Michelle trust me. Excellent. Brian and Valerie, being, uh, <laughs> being producers of this film, how was it easy to basically bring sort of like this psychological thriller to fruition or was it challenging for yourselves? Well, I just have to say that it is never easy um, to make a movie. Uh, and I was going to say to, in response to the first question that my, uh, my favorite part, honestly, is to watch the magic of making a movie because there's nothing like looking around a set and, and seeing all these people. It takes so many people to get, you know, three minutes of film, you know, going and then to watch the process of, of Grant and Sonia, you know, they just you watching them doing their scene. It's like they're this married couple. They've known each other forever. And then you realize, you remember, no, they, they did it not. They just met, you know, however long. But this is the, you know, you, you, you make up your set, you make up, that we were in this house shooting. And, you know, this is a house where people live. Happy memories are made in that house. But the magic of movie made this very creepy house. <laughs> and when, you know, it was late at night and we were shooting, I was, you know, walking, uh, threading carefully, just, uh, just in case, so. And to add to that, there's there's always things that one does not expect to happen. Uh, when we were filming Bad Impulse and we were in this beautiful house Valerie was mentioning, that was when the fires came to Los Angeles and we were actually evacuated from our set and had to move to a whole other location in order to continue filming, which actually turned out to be great because we actually found this spectacular location. Um, so it was a, a happy accident, but uh, these kinds of crazy things happen all the time. It's, it's not so much fun in the moment, but afterwards it makes for great stories and memories and, 
and you know a, a little notch on your on your holster there. Yeah, fil filmmaking is a pro is such a process, right? And so much of it is painstaking little moments that you don't see. Um, for me, and I, I think for a screenwriter, um, one of the most exciting things that, that happens on set when you get when you do get to take part on set, which is rare, um, and I do, should mention that Michelle was very generous in having the writer on set um, frequently, which is not often the case with all directors. Um, one of my favorite moments is actually watching um, the actors prepare uh, for a scene, sort of the stuff you don't see on camera, the, the sort of emotional preparation that goes into a moment that's caught on camera. When you're, when you're writing something and you're creating these scenarios, especially what happens in, in Bad Impulse, which is, you know, at, at times bleak and intense and challenging, you forget that, that there's real people and real artists that have to figure out how to make this work and bring it to life. And when you see that happening, when you see the preparation happening, it's, it's just pretty amazing and humbling, right? To watch someone like Grant, like put in the work that he put in to, to make this real and to make Henry a, a human going through this on screen. A lot goes into it that you don't see. And so there's this, there's, that's the behind the scenes magic that I just love about the process. Well, Grant, everyone's talking about you, obviously. <laughs> well, if, you, if you're silent long enough, they do. It's a trick I learned a long time ago. Now, um, for me, it's, uh, I mean, it's, I think for everybody too, it's many things and, and people point out the ones that strike them most immediately. I love crews. I have to say this, the, for, I think I've been doing this for nearly 30 years now and I just love crews. I really do. I love them, and and we had a we had a wonderful crew, an incredibly hard working crew on this. And there's nothing more I love about filmmaking because you'd be doing theater otherwise, you know, which is, is is great in itself. But you know, the crew is what changes it, what separates it, what makes the difference. And um, we had a fantastic crew. I think you know, I, I I always think every job I've ever done, we've got a better crew than we deserve, you know, and. I don't know, it's just the way I look at them because they, you know, I'll come in and I might prepare and I'll probably spend a bit of time, you know, when I'm not there working on the on the project, but um, I've never worked harder than my crew. Never never done more hours than my crew. And uh, no actor ever will. So, you know, for the crew and, and the young guys and girls, you know, who were on the job, who were um, just so full of energy and life. And again, I've been doing this for nearly 30 years, so... Working with, you know, young adults who are on their first or second job, who are that excitement, that um, just that energy and the wonder and the amazement that they have that, you know, oh my God, this is, you know, this is happening and this is what you do. It's kind of great because it reminds me how lucky I am to do my job and how lucky we all are, you know, that it's just such a wonderful thing. Um, and, you know, and, 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 and of always, and the last thing is that chemistry, you know, that can happen with another actor in the right moment. You know, it's like trying to catch, you know, lightning in a bottle and, and on days when you catch it, you know, the best days in the world and the days that you don't are the worst days in the world. They're like that nightmare that someone was talking about before the Q&A, you know, and of course, working with everybody. Excellent. Uh, we Before I get to another question on Instagram, I just want to quickly uh, ask Nicholas and Oscar, bring them that on board. Your on-screen da dad um, being played by Grant, was he lovable or terrifying when you acted against him? <laughs> um, well, we were talking right before the, the Zoom meeting started here. I heard um, Michelle ask Oscar about uh, how he was terrified uh, at a few certain scenes. <laughs> um, I, well, I mean, it, um, in the scenes where he's lovable, he was very lovable. In the scenes where he's terrifying, he was very terrifying. <laughs> um, and just being with Grant, I mean, it, it's both. It's been a bit of both. <laughs> what about for you, Oscar? Um, yeah, there was this one scene that we were doing one time, um, and I was supposed to come in the room, or no, leave the room, and he screamed so hard that I got so scared. I ran so fast. And it was just perfect for the scene. 
<laughs> Excellent. Let's go to a question from Instagram. For Michelle and the producers, what do you look in your actors while casting? Well, you know, in this movie, I mean, I was so lucky to have a, <clears throat> a mix of wonderful, you know, trained actors, uh, veteran actors, and the newcomers, you know, the kids. And it's great to watch on set how the young kids learn uh, from, you know, the more seasoned actors. Um, you know, I, I've been casting my own movies so far. My next movie, I understand I'm going to have this wonderful casting director because I know so many actors that I'm able to just pick up the phone and reach out to them and ask them uh, or somebody facilitates, you know, a meeting or something. Um, you know, that they can really inhabit the character in a very passionate way and that they are willing to come on set and just explore and play and try things. And, you know, I like to try things. I, I like the combination of preparation and then the unknown and really being able, but I think you can improvise best if you're prepared. And so I'm looking for actors that are open in that way and flexible and love to play. And of course, I, I knew Grant really well. Uh, and I knew Paul Servino because I had done another movie with him. So I, we had enjoyed working together. Um, and I knew some of these kids because <laughs> they know me, <laughs> related by blood. Uh, you know, I always figure, you know, with these movies and I have a, few, a couple of kids it's best to have them on set and see them in front of me so I see what they're doing. Um, but uh, yeah, I love actors. You know, I come from a background of being an actress myself. And, uh, and then I started teaching acting. Uh, and now I've taught acting for several decades. And uh, I love actors. I love the collaboration of actors. And, um, and just, you know, I, I feel like to act is something that's very courageous. It's very brave. So um, I find there's a lot of bravery. And, and also Michelle tends to um, think outside of the box. So a lot of times when we're in casting meetings talking about actors and I'll say, oh, you know, what about this person? It's like, oh, that's so on the nose or whatever. And, and then she'll pick somebody and I'll be like, what? And, uh, and then suddenly they'll be in the part and they'll be fabulous. So. You know, it's uh, it it's really great to uh, to think outside of the box in casting as well. So. Yeah, yeah. Now working with Michelle on that, I have to say one of my my most favorite parts is to watch how it all comes together, because you start with well Grant obviously not to, uh, but then you cast you know you're thinking of another somebody else for the for another part, and that brings in well what if so and so then was the love interest, and so you you know, you look, how did this three play together? And then, so no, she takes one piece out and she'll put another, she'll think of another actor that might be, and it just changes the whole picture. So it becomes, it's really a collage that has to all work together. Um, and I always find that very interesting because it's really, you just have to have the patience to have all these moving pieces and who's available and who's not and who would have been great. And okay, well then now it doesn't work with that. Um, so I find that uh, it's a, anticipation and excitement and nerve wracking as a producer, of course, <laughs> because you don't know, you don't know sometimes till the day before, um, you know, they're supposed to be showing up on set, but that person's actually coming. So. Or who that person will be. <laughs> I've enjoyed a wonderful collaboration, uh, you know, with Jason, the writer. So he has gotten numerous texts and calls from me going, what about that actor? What do you think about that actor? You know. Excellent. Well, obviously there are more people behind the scenes. Let's bring in Holly, who is the composer for this, because Holly, I noticed the piano chords. I noticed the strings, you know, to a crescendo. I mean, how did you want to approach your, your music co composition towards a, you know, a psychological thriller like this? Well, this one was really fun um, to echo what Jason said. I, grew up on Twilight Zone too, like huge Twilight Zone fan. So when Michelle and Valerie approached me with this, I can't remember if you sent me the script first or we had a meeting first, but I did read the script early on 
Um, and I was like, I love this. This reminds me of a Twilight Zone episode. So I was really excited to jump on board. And I think what was interesting about this one was the heart of it is this family, you know? So that's where kind of the more orchestral elements come into play. But then we have the security system, you know, and some underlying supernatural elements and whatever. So I mixed in some synths. So the synths were kind of like played the technical technological side of it. And then the orchestral stuff on top was our emotion and the family and what grounded us. And what I loved about working with these guys is they all had really great taste in music and they all loved melody, you know, and we talked a lot about themes and certain thematic material and how we would use it. And for a composer, that's a dream, you know. Um, so we, we worked really well together in, in crafting it and making sure it was all right. <laughs> Deferi, tell us about your approach on editing because, you know, with, a lot of people don't know, without a great editor, the movie's nothing. So, <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have this wonderful opportunity to work with uh, Michelle. Uh, she, she lets me, you know, see the script way ahead of time. Um, and I, I read several versions of the script. Um, and you, I have a lot of freedom to explore, um, you know, where we want to go with the script. Um, and that is what I like about it. I've, I have, um, in-depth knowledge of where she would like to go before we start, you know, we get, we go on set. And once we're on set, it's, uh, you know, I, I actually lived in the house uh, for 10 or 11 days that we were uh, filming and um, being there with the crew and everybody working, um, starting from the PA, seeing everybody work is just, um, it's just wonderful. And the creative side, um, it's really Michelle's instinct. Uh, she has a very unique instinct on where the vision is. And I just follow that vision and explore different things. We really flow um, in the editing room. Uh, we explore several options for, you know, for each scene, for each frame. Um, it's just something I can't explain. I just, we just really, uh, we're on the same page on, on most things. And uh, I trust uh, where she wants to take me. And within that, I have a lot of freedom to uh, explore many elements in the script. Um, and then she picks and chooses what she likes. And, you know, sometimes I might not agree with things, but later when I look at, look back at it, it's like, Oh yes, absolutely. You were absolutely right. She's seeing a bigger picture than what I'm seeing. So, um, you know, I learn a lot in every movie. This is our, I think, third movie, right? Together. Um, it's just so uh, surprising. We should, we should give directors like Michelle uh, a lot of opportunities, more opportunities. We need to make movies with people like Michelle. We need, to, we need to nominate them for the Oscars. I mean, nobody can put this together. I'm, I'm telling you, it's uh, because I see the, the behind the scenes. I'm with her in a lot of the, uh, the process. It's not easy. It's not easy. So, you know, we, we try to look at every frame uh, with respect and love, you know? So uh, that's, that's my approach. I love the movie because of her. So that's where the creative lies and, and well, that's the process. Then, you know, thank you, Teferi. You know, Teferi is truly the invisible artist in the room. And he does look at every frame with love and respect. And he cares so much. And he does so much thorough work by the time I get there. And he's so patient. He has the patient, uh, patience of a saint. Because honestly, I have Libra in my personality. And so it's just, I see things like in all different ways. And I, you know, it's not that I don't, I have the inability to make a decision because I know how to make a decision. It's just that I look at every side of it. It's painful. And he has so much patience and I always want to see it a million different ways. Um, but, uh, 
you know, when you find people that you collaborate with, like Teferi, um, you know, who's just uh, extraordinary, like Holly, who I've worked so well with and enjoyed it so much, and she's so collaborative with everybody, and my producers, I mean, I really, um, you know, there, there's a village here. There truly is a village, and there's a few people that are not part of it, because we this, this we could have had a lot more people come onto the Zoom, but we thought it was you know too many people. But I know that some are watching, and you know, uh, Larray was my extraordinary costume designer, and uh, Alessandra Manias, a uh, wonderful, wonderful production designer, and ha um, uh, Sandra um, Hanson Valve, who can be she was my director of photography. So I mean. You know, and these are uh, wonderful artists that I've collaborated with and, and with Teferi and and I've worked with Brian on I don't know how many movies and Valerie and we have a very special way of talking to each other uh, because we know each other so well. You know, it's, it's great when you have a group of wonderful artists around you that are willing to take the journey. Absolutely. Well, we have another question from, um, from the audience. So what is it like to play a character that you are nothing like that's like you in real life? Let's go ahead and ask Darren first because he is a villain and I'm assuming he's not a villain in real life. Yeah, I wasn't really a villain. I was more so um, uh, Nico's character, Mike, his best friend. And uh, yeah, it was weird. You know, in high school, I always, you know, played sports and, you know, was very social and this character was the opposite, very um, kept to himself, very quiet. You know, we had a little storyline, a little crush on uh, Mike's sister who was played by Abby. So it was sort of cool to see, you know, I had to draw back in high school, like, you know, kids that maybe I didn't hang out with, but were sort of this way and like how they acted around people and how they talked and, I drew on that a lot and Michelle was really good in, in helping me with that. So that was really a great learning experience for me too. And side note, I remember on the first day of shooting, Grant and I, we didn't have any scenes together, but I met him like our trailers overlapped and I can't remember who the other actor was, but the three of us were talking about long work days and uh, I'll never forget this story, Grant. I don't know if you remember this. And we were talking about, well, how long is the longest you've ever worked in a day? And uh, cause it was a night shoot. It was like a 10 or 11 hour shoot that night uh, for bad impulse. And uh, I go, yeah, this is probably my longest day. And Grant goes, oh, I've shot a 27 hour day. And I go, wait, what? And he goes, yeah, I shot for 15 hours in Australia, flew back in time to America and went straight to set. And I, I don't know if Grant remembers telling me that, but I tell that story and that, that, that like, that's what drives me like hearing that, like, I want to be able to do that one day too. And that was, really cool literally my first day on a feature film set uh doing that was uh that was really cool to hear that that experience and it's still a privilege mate you know absolutely That's, it's still a privilege and and we can guarantee the crew is still working harder i was yeah. shooting um a shooting studio on the killer elite in melbourne and i was promised to atlas shrugged in la and uh, nobody would give in and, and if you're an actor and two sets of executive producers w won't budge, you, you shoot all day in Melbourne and you jump on a flight and you fly uh, from Melbourne to Los Angeles. And by the time you land in Los Angeles, it's about six hours earlier than when you left. <laughs> so yeah, I, I still want to claim the longest work day in the history of acting. Same calendar day. Same calendar day, yeah. But that's dedication, I'd say. Well, there was a lot of, uh, but you know, to be fair to everybody involved, I had a, I had a lot of in-flight dinners and, and, a, and a couple of movies and a bit of a nap in the middle there, you know. Oh, well, enough. then it doesn't count, Grant. It doesn't That's count. It. You have to That's discount it. those hours. As far as I'm concerned, I was spoiled. To be in work like that is, is a gift. Well, obviously, and, and for a moment, I thought Grant actually invented the time machine to manage to create uh, extra hours in his day. To get Mate, if they could invent a time machine, I tell you what, um, it would have entered Hollywood a long, long time ago. There would have been a way to get everybody to work like an, an infinite number more days on every project, you know, because uh, <laughs> that's what it is, isn't it? You know, it's 
the film industry is, is we need this much time and this much time costs this much money and the money is the limiting factor and, you know, and that determines the amount of time you've got, which is, I mean, you know, I, I don't want to go on, but it's, it's, it's what's extraordinary about what the producers and, and Michelle have done on this, which is it's really one of those projects that seems to me to be a force of will project. Um, they're just people who, who don't take no for an answer and um, extraordinary uh, force of will they exhibited through the project in order to get it home. And I think it takes that. And I think they all had that in spades. And, um, and Michelle in particular, she's just uh, has an enormous passion to, to get projects up and then to see them through to the end. So I'm in complete admiration of all of them. And I'll shut up now. <laughs> Well, let's, let's ask any of you guys this because the movie Bad Impulse is about, you know, technology that actually has gone awry. So are you guys scared of technology or you fully embrace it um, for yourselves? It drives me up the wall. I, <laughs> I, I'm in my apartment in New York and I want to play my music and I put on my Sonos and it, goes away and I go to my computer and the Wi-Fi is off and it's just, you know, we become so dependent on this technology and um, I guess maybe I'm a, a little bit older than the gang here and um, I, I, I do remember all the pre-technology and uh, um, to me, it was a lot easier. <laughs> it was a lot better. Uh, technology does not make life better. It, it makes it more frustrating and difficult. And I feel that we spend more time trying to fix our technology than getting on with life. Um, but that being said, I, I, I'm not that fast to give it up. So it's uh, it, and that's kind of what bad impulse is like. <laughs> no, uh, it it really a... kind of walks that balance about, uh, I, and I think we're just in a time right now. I mean, you look what's going on with SpaceX and you know these all these things going on. Soon we're going to Mars, and we're we are in the transition. We are in this transitional period. And life is going to change. I mean, I, I, I look at someone like Oscar and I, I really envy him because um, he's really going to get to see some amazing things. Uh, I mean, you too, Nicholas, but Oscar's a little younger. Um, and uh, it, it really is a very um, magical time as long as it continues the way it's going there was this 50 year period where nothing happened. Uh, but, um, you know, technology, you know, of course is our future. It's just getting a handle on it. It's, it's really getting a handle on it. And at the moment, I really don't think we, we do. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a, it's a, well, it's a I like what um, Brian is saying about, you know, how wonderful it is. Uh, but I have to tell you that I don't appreciate my phone telling me where my car is parked if I didn't ask it. So, you know, it's, uh, I enjoy all those, uh, you know, great perks, but then you do get a sense that somehow it has a mind of its own. Um, and that's the part where I think it intersects with the story that Jason wrote, which is, you know, you're attracted by the benefit, but somewhere there's an unintended consequence that I don't think we're all ready for. Well, n nothing has had a larger impact on human behavior than the smartphone. Like it is, it is a, a thousand percent evolved us as a species. Um, if scientific studies, our brains are working differently um, than they did before this. Our attention spans are different. Um, the way we engage with each other is different. And these are lasting generational changes to the human race. Um, and in a lot of ways, there are those good sides, right, Brian? I mean, kids are smarter now. They're faster. They're more intuitive. They, they pick up new skills. They, they're better at um, 
you know, that sort of high brain stuff, right? Making connections, it just comes faster. And you'll see that if you ever put a video game console in a kid's hand and then hand it to grandpa and see what happens and how, how different the engagement is, right? But we don't, we don't actually know what the end game is for how we're being changed by the technology that we're utilizing. So there's this enormous positive side. Look, we're in the middle of a, of a global pandemic. I'm in Southern California. We can't leave our homes. Like we're in this devastating time right now. And here we are together, right? Engaging with each other, seeing each other, sharing the film with the world. Like that's incredibly special, right? But uh, on the other side, I do think that there's an awful lot of things that we take for granted in our lives as a good. And we have no idea, none, how they actually work and what they're doing to us in the long term. So it's, it's, it's troubling. You read any articles by anyone who, who built social media enterprises and ask them if they let their kids utilize these things, um, you start to see sort of the flip side of, of technology. So, you know, I, I absolutely think of it as hugely valuable to civilization, uh, but with a big blinking morning light, which is we don't know where it's taking us and, um, and it is leading the way. Yeah. I'd like, I'd like to quickly say that you, you mentioned um, that uh, because of technology, kids are getting smarter today. <laughs> I don't know if I, I think, tech, I think that smartphones especially might argue the opposite if you spend enough time on there. Um, but it, to, to everyone's point and, you know, to bring it a little bit of the, the younger perspective. Um, well, you know, I, I'd say, you know, technology, I, I definitely agree. And remind, I just think of, when I think of technology and I especially think of like, uh, progress. I think of technology as a tool. Like anything, it's a tool and it's not inherently good or bad. What matters is how you use it. I think about um, uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey. Of course, that's a major theme in that movie that I think rubs off a lot on that impulse. I, I know you were inspired by uh, The Shining, Jason, when you wrote it. So I don't know if any other Kubrick influences got on there. Um, but no, oh, yeah, I think that uh, a big part of that this of this film has a bit of that philosophy where uh, obviously technology is the antagonist but it's also acting as an extension of you know not to give anything away for anyone watching who is uh, you know hasn't seen the movie yet but acts as a sort of extension of those using it uh, rather than technology is like a purely evil thing and I think also you know um I, I don't use any social media. I know this is being uh, uh, broadcast on Facebook and Instagram. I don't use any social media accounts personally. I don't do Twitter or Instagram or anything like that. I'm in the minority among a lot of my friends on that. Um, and I think it's interesting uh, seeing how, it, like, it, obviously technology generally relates to this film, but also social media specifically, especially in the idea of bad impulses because uh, about impulse control really it's like um you know it's like technology putting you into a state where you know that kind of like that, that that part of you that stops yourself from acting on you know these worst impulses from thinking before you speak can be kind of numbed in a way it's so much easier to technology pushes you to a place where it's so much easier to act upon uh those impulses whether you know in a real world example to you know say something stupid and put it out into the world for millions to see without thinking of it and then in you know the world of the movie you know ki kill your family members yeah like what was what nico was saying basically um was that i watched the social a uh, social dilemma and i was horrified about what things had been going on just because of internet um, and our entire, like, I don't, um, but like our entire um, human race is just monopolized by all this time and um, all this power that's not really being used um, well. And yeah. That's very deep, Nicholas. I tell, I tell you, I've got such smart children, Michelle. <laughs> it, it, it's really lovely to hear my boys. They've obviously listen to their father, they're so bright. <laughs> of course, Oscar, it's only the richest, you've always got to remember that. Only the richest people in the world get affected by technology. A third of the world's population don't have access to clean water. 
So, you know, when we talk about these problems, to me, we always remind, we always remind me as a collective of, of the French court slightly before the revolution. You know, we're talking about the 1%. Our biggest problems are, are the 1% for other people. And, and that's always good to keep in mind. A lot of people in the world without a smartphone. So, you know, my debate with um, social media, and I have one, don't worry, Nicholas, uh, is, is, is nowhere near as important as, as you know, clean water and, and somewhere to bathe. So it is interesting because it's all in context. And maybe that's another thing that we're all getting, you know, there's this great uh, myth that with uh, the internet, we're all getting closer together. But there's a huge number of people who, who were left out of this entirely, you know, whether it be economic or social, and, and nobody knows where that leads. Anyway, enough. <laughs> Absolutely. And I, I do want to bring up is uh, the film is, you know, technology in this film kind of influenced the family in one way or another, whether it's supernatural or not, which is very similar you know, like how we could be talking right now. And then the next moment we would see like an ad for McDonald's if we were talking about McDonald's as if technology can now read our minds. I mean, does, does that kind of create paranoia with some of us here? That's what Oscar was talking about with the social uh, dilemma. It's a documentary on that and uh, it's extraordinary. It shows how we're led to make all of our choices uh, you know, in, on Facebook and uh, apparently, allegedly, so I don't get in any trouble, allegedly uh, <laughs> get in, you know, made to make all of our choices. It's very interesting stuff. And I think Jason's tapped into that. Totally. Tapped into that fear of losing your humanity, you know. These characters are trying to protect their humanity. Um, this is a very interesting conversation. And I think that, um, Jason, you really wrote a script that makes you think. And all the people that I have been speaking with, you know, that have watched the movie, they really, the, the feedback said that it really makes them think, you know, about that and, and many other things, but certainly about all of what we're talking about. For, for, the, for the cast, uh, Grant, Nicholas, and Oscar, because you guys have to create a family dynamic. Did you, what did you guys do on set to create to create your chemistry with each other? Did you guys hang out, play paintball, swing bats at each other beforehand? What, what did you guys do? I chased them around the halls a lot with uh, carving knives. It seemed to, um, it seemed to set the tone. Uh, wonder, wonderful family bonding activities, of course. 100%. Now, these guys were great. I actually had my uh, kids out, particularly my son, my youngest, a lot of the time. And, and, uh, and he was hanging out with everybody a lot, wasn't he, guys? And so it, it kind of developed pretty naturally because I was keeping an eye on all of them a lot, a lot of the time, and especially when we're shooting on location. But we did. We hung out. We talked. Uh, Nicholas and I had a, God, we had an endless number of conversations about everything, didn't we, buddy? Yeah. I think one of my favorite, uh, you know, one of my favorite moments in the film, actually, because a lot of it was, you know, we were having conversations like in between takes right before scenes. And there was, there's one scene you see, uh, it's one of my favorite, like, little things that you would pick up in the film. We're having this conversation while the whole family's out getting cupcakes. And uh, you and me, like, uh, right before we started shooting, we're talking about, um, uh, I was bringing up a stupid Batman villain. <laughs> <laughs> it was like a very, a very obscure comic book character called the Ten-Eyed Man, whose stupid superpower is seen through his fingers. And you can hear, you know, my character Mike uh, talking about that with his dad. And what's really funny about that is that then much later in the film, you have a fantastic moment of improv when you're at uh, the dinner party and everyone has, you know, these like masks at the table. It's like one of those like fancy type of parties. And you do this very fun, very fun joke with like putting on the mask, like I'm Batman. <laughs> now I'm Wayne, right before the scene. And I just find that's a very fun, small connection. Yeah, and probably, yeah, they, they probably do go together. You probably stuck that in the back of my head. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let's not forget uh, there, there are, two main cast members who are not here right now is Sonia mm -hmm. and Paul Servino. Since they are not here, we get to talk about them. How were they on production and why were they so great or bad, whichever. 
fantastic. But Michelle, you, you're, you're the one qualified to talk about that. Well, you know, um, Paul was going to come and do his scenes in a few days. And he said, you know what, I'm going to give you extra time. I'm going to come extra days to work because he uh -huh. really wanted to dig in deep. And, uh, and he did. He was, um, he really went in really, really deep. Um, and he gives just a, a wonderful, wonderful performance. Uh, I've always loved Paul Sorvino. I've always loved his work. Um, I remember running into him in New York. It's a, an Italian restaurant. What was that Italian restaurant, Lexington Avenue, Valerie? Do you remember that Italian restaurant? I remember running into nope, him. I don't and remember the name. Nero. And so, you know, I've known Paul and, and you know, I've uh, loved working with Paul. He wrote me a wonderful, lovely email. Um, and Sonia, you know, is a very, also uh, went so deep in. Uh, we all talked about that wonderful script that she had. She really thinks about the character and she writes a lot of notes and and, and for this particular script, she leaves it, you know, in, in her car. She doesn't bring it with her, uh, which I, uh, I thought was an interesting thing, how she separates herself from working on a character. You know, sometimes when, you, you know, you work on characters, you've you got to pay the price for it. Sometimes it's, you know, you, um, you, you pay a certain price. And so you have to find a way to separate, especially when you go home at night and you've got kids and you, you have to find a way and then go back on set and dig in deep again. And I thought that Sonia really did that. And she has a wonderfully brilliant uh, balance of, you know, intellectual choices and really visceral, emotional, you know, uh, gravitas. She really gets in there. Um, and the, the relationship that you guys created uh, was so real. It was so mm -hmm. real. We really believed in this marriage we believed in the family. I we did some improvs. I don't know if you remember Grant when we were you know at the theater rehearsing. We improvised a little bit, but I think that cemented the texture. But the I still family. don't understand why the improvisation had to be Sonia pulling down my pants and spanking me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know that's all part of it. <laughs> okay, all right, it's all part of work. No, she's a she's an incredibly gifted actress and 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 amazingly. Uh, intelligent and focused, and, but very, very, very ta uh, talented. And I think you get a good relationship, you know, when there's a lot of respect, you know. I, had, I, did, I, well, I can't speak for Sonia, but I had an enormous amount of respect for her. And Paul Savino's a god, man. I mean, you, you got you to gotta shoot a few scenes with Paul before you die. I think it's mandatory. One-on-one, -on -one, because he's a very interesting dude. He's a beautiful man. I thought what Michelle was saying was that um, Grant and Sonia were amazing actors uh, because it was basically my first time um, working with really uh, amazing people. And I was watching it this one scene um, because I had finished for that day. Um, I was watching and they looked like they were fighting. But then I realized, oh, they're just getting into character. And it was so <laughs> deep and destructive then I didn't think how like amazing they were into doing and how hardworking they were to this so I wanted to say that how great they were of actors I don't know I just wanted to add um, that I had the actually I had the privilege really of working with both Dan Loria uh, who's also not here and Paul Sorvino and it really to work with seasoned actors uh, like like these two gentlemen is just incredible. They show up with such presence and such, I mean, Paul Servino, uh, at the one point we were shooting in a mall and uh, he just, he was having dinner and it was not feasible really for him to get back to have dinner with everyone and uh, then get back to the scene on time just because of how it was situated. And uh, so I had the privilege of having dinner with him, just the two of us. And I have to say, thank you, Michelle, <laughs> for organizing that location just so that I could do that. But I also got to hear his amazing stories, uh, his friendship with George T. Scott and his experience on these other sets. And uh, to have the um, perspective of somebody who's done it for that long um, was just uh, really 
you know, this is priceless. Um, and Dan Loria was the most unassuming actor. I mean, for who he is and for the tremendous talent that he brings, um, he, his trailer was, you know, again, you know, the locations are not all nearby and all that. He said, I'm just gonna go sit in my car. Don't worry. <laughs> Do you want to? No, I'm, I have my water in my car. I'm good. It's just, it was just because they really, it's all about the work for them. It's just really all about the work. And you could see Paul Serino, he had this little twinkle in his eye, you know, as he was preparing for some scenes and we were eating dinner and he was, you know, running through some of his lines. And like I said, to me, that was just a window, talk about like a window into like the movie magic. It was, that's really, I'll never forget it. Um, so, so privileged to have worked with, uh, with both of them. Sonia uh, was very much into her character. I didn't want to leave her out, but because she was so into her character, I really didn't get to spend any time with her at all, <laughs> except for when uh, we did a, a behind the scenes interview, which is when she revealed, as a matter of fact, why I had personally, I had seen so little of her off of her, uh, you know, on, uh, when she wasn't working because she really uh, concentrated, you know, so much into what she was doing. And as Michelle said, she described her whole process uh, in terms of working you know, in her uh, trailer and how she would bring some things to comfort her and to basically separate her from the character that she played as she stepped off her trailer, you know, uh, into the into the scene. I mean, she took on uh, it, right down to the outfit that she was wearing, you know, it was just sort of really putting on the, the character onto her. Um, so she definitely uh, kept to herself so she could stay, you know, in her character throughout. And, um, um Two things, uh, Gig. I just want to tell you that we're welcoming Bjorn Johnson, who played the character of the bearded man in Bad Impulse. Thank you, Bjorn, for joining us. Uh, also a wonderful actor and very good friend of mine for many, many years. We worked on another movie together, actually my first movie. Uh, and uh, hi, Bjorn. Hi, hi, hi. It's, uh, I've been watching you guys on Facebook and uh, didn't realize I could actually get involved, but... Uh, <laughs> I'm happy to be here. Hi, Grant. Uh, hi, hi, everyone. I know so many of these folks. And, and this, you know, just very briefly for me, this was such an exciting project because, as Michelle mentioned, I did know so, you know, there's many, many new people to, uh, to encounter and get to know. But there's all kinds of old bloodlines going back to this movie. Brian and I go way, way back. And Michelle and I go way, way back. I was in the second uh, season of with with uh, Mr. Servino of um, Law and Order, so <laughs> it was fun to make a, a, a reacquaintance with him. Uh, and uh, the one short thing I think that's interesting that I don't think I haven't heard talked about very often uh, is is great to see Grant again. Uh, when you do a, we had a fight in, in a fight scene in the show. <laughs> we did, mate. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it there's a there's an amazing sort of intimacy that um, is required for a fight scene because it has to look good, but you have to repeat it over and over and over again. So there's this level of trust. Um, there's this level of um, communication that happens. And, and we didn't have much time to prepare. We had, we had a very uh, uh, a talented fight director with us, uh, the stunt coordinator, but, uh, uh, and he gave us some you know, terrific guidance, but it gets, you know, when you're working on a film like this, it, it's something run, wonderful right away. And, uh, it was just really fun to dance with Grant on that. And uh, I felt very trusting of him. And I think he felt that of me, I hope. Yeah. Um, but it's a, that's, that's a whole kind of intimacy that uh, is very unique on a film. It's, uh, and I'm just gonna butt in here. It's interesting that um, I've done a lot of that stuff. And uh, this is gonna sound strange to say, but I think that um, fight scenes take a lot more intimacy than love scenes. Uh, there's not as much chance of getting hurt badly in a, in a love scene as there is in a fight scene. And I really do think you've got to trust the other person. And it's true. It's always a really intimate experience. It really is. Thank you for your intimacies. <laughs> well, it's funny too, because uh, Michelle originally approached me on this project as a stunt coordinator, but I just uh, shared with her that I just didn't feel like I had this, this, film has so much automobile uh, violence in it. Mm -hmm. And though that, that can appear very simple, that's another whole language. I have lots and lots of experience. I, I've directed fights on Broadway and a lot of regional theaters and I, I, I've been very involved in that 
more in my past. Um, but I w didn't feel like I was equipped to do that. So it was really exciting to have her come back around and go, you know, there's this part. <laughs> so it was really exciting to come in. Excellent. Well, we're, we're at the tail end of this uh, Q&A discussion as I cannot get that image of a Grant's pants getting pulled down that was mentioned <laughs> ten, 10 minutes ago. But uh, I would, li would like to basically close it out that the movie is now available on iTunes, Amazon Video, Google Play, YouTube Prime, Vudu, Microsoft, Xbox, and Fandango, and On Demand. So thank you for listening to everyone here with the cast and crew of Bad Impulse. Go check it out now. So anyways, Thank you very much, um, everyone. You, everyone here, done an amazing job and can't wait to see what your next project is. Maybe there's a bad impulse too. <laughs> Jason, write it. <laughs> really bad impulse. <laughs> bad impulse too, badder impulse. <laughs> naughty, naughty impulse. <laughs> You should go down the aliens route and do bad impulses. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Grant, before we get thank check off, so I just want to tell you thank you again for doing this project because uh, really you, you brought such, uh, you know, um, unpredictability to your character. It just was one of the things I wanted to say, you know, throughout the evening. You, I watched you many, many times as we did all the, you know, post that, and I just never, never got old. Thank you. Well, I, I'm, thank you. And I'm sure it's frustrating for Michelle because it's impossible to get me to do two takes in a row that are the same. So mm -hmm. it's more a matter of ADHD and a, a slight bipolar disorder than it is a skill set. But uh, it's an absolute joy. It's really good. I'm going to sign off, but it's, it was really good seeing everybody. Good seeing everyone. You too, Thanks Grant. You, Grant. Bye, Bye, Take care of yourselves, Bye. all right? Don't Bye. Get... Take care. <laughs> See you. Cheers. Bye, everybody. Hey, Gig, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.